I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. We're going to look together at verses 21 to 35, and from those verses, I'd like us to consider the topic of forgiving one another as we have been forgiven. Forgiving one another as we have been forgiven. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord one more time in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can gather together this morning in the name of the King, King Jesus. Thank you that he is not a dead king, but he is a living king, a risen, reigning, and returning king. Lord Jesus, thank you for the great privilege of just being your children. Thank you for forgiving our sins through your death on the cross. Thank you for rising that we might be made right with the Father and have the hope of eternal life. Thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit upon us and for changing our hearts and putting your very life within us. Lord, we want to live as those who have been redeemed, not just from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. As those who have tasted your mercy and kindness, Lord, we want to be eager and quick. We want it to be our joy to forgive one another as you have lavished us freely and fully in your forgiveness. So would you please use your word this morning to do that, Lord, please, to uh, produce in us repentance where it's needed, where we've been withholding forgiveness, where we've been harboring bitterness or resentment, um, and enable us to repent, Lord, and to quickly and joyfully forgive now and in the future those who have and those who will sin against us. Would you do that, Lord? that your mercy and your love would be on display. It would be reflected to some degree that you would be glorified and honored uh, in our midst together and in our individual lives. We, we trust you and we ask you for this. Please guard me from hypocrisy um, and as I speak and guard uh, all of us from hypocrisy as we listen to you right now. Please, we ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. As I said, we're going to look at verses 21 to 35, and just before we do that, uh, we're parachuting, right, down somewhere into the middle of Matthew's gospel, and anytime we do that, I trust you know, you're well taught here, that it is important, it's helpful to take a look at the context around the verses that we're going to be studying, and in the immediate preceding context are verses 15 to 20. And there, Jesus is addressing the really sadly all too common scenario where one follower of Christ sins against another follower of Christ. And seemingly, they both appear to be in the same local church or congregation. He says, you see there in verse 15, if your brother sins against you. And then he goes on from there. What Jesus is doing with this conditional statement, I believe, is He's giving a New Testament or a New Covenant version of what is commonly called case law. Uh, Just as Moses would often in the Old Testament say, if this and this and this happens, then here's what Yahweh, your Lord and God, wants you to do in that situation. So here Jesus says, uh, if your brother sins against you, and that could be brother or sister in the Lord, and here is King Jesus as the king over his kingdom citizens, instructing us on how we're to deal with personal offenses within the body of Christ. And I'll just summarize what he says here. He gives us, as you know, four steps to take as needed, depending on the response of the person who sinned against us. You see there in verse 15, he says, Step one, go and tell the person their fault in private, just between the two of you. Then he says there, though, that, If your brother or sister will 
listen to you, then you've gained your brother. You've won them. And there's nothing further that's needed. But, he says in verse 16, if he does not listen to your appeal, then, step two, take one or two others with you and go and speak to the person again in order that you may establish, by the evidence of two or three witnesses, the accusations, the charges that you have against this Christian. Again, if what's implied here is if, if you win them at this point, there's no further action needed. Mission accomplished. But, unfortunately, verse 17, if the brother or sister still refuses to listen even to them, that is now to the uh, additional witnesses to the charges, then Jesus instructs us to tell it to the church, inform the local congregation about the situation so that they then have an opportunity to collectively appeal to the sinning brother or sister and to call them to repentance. But if that professing believer still refuses to listen and to repent, in verse 17, Jesus says, step four, then let that person be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. He says the church is to effectively remove the person from the congregation and to relate to him or her like an unclean, notorious sinner. No matter what they profess with their words, their unwillingness to turn from their sin demonstrates that they need to be removed from the congregation. But what is the end goal of going to another believer and confronting them for their sin against you? What's the ultimate purpose of involving other believers, even informing the congregation, even removing someone from our midst of the fellowship of a local church if they refuse to repent of their sin? Well, the answer is not just to simply get something off your chest or to vent in anger to that person. It's not to take out some form of personal revenge on them verbally. It's not even for a small group of friends to gossip about someone's faults. It's not for church leaders to scare people into agreeing with them about everything they teach and practice. It's not for a church to publicly shame someone for what they've done. In fact, in these verses, it's not even primarily or ultimately for the purity of the church. Here, Jesus' emphasis is that the primary aim in all of this, what we commonly call church discipline, whether at the initial individual level of the offended party going to the offender privately, or in the final collective corporate level of removing someone from the church who will not repent, the end goal is that the sinning believer will listen. You notice that word multiple times. Listen to the appeals of others and be won back, gained to the person they've sinned against, and if necessary, even to the local church. And just before we get into our passage, I just want to stress, don't forget that. I know that's what you're taught here. But don't forget that. Your aim in confronting sin in the church, whether individually or collectively, is to lovingly serve your brother who's in sin, or to help your sister, humbly help her with her sin, to gently come alongside of them and assist them to be God's instrument in helping them to repent of their sin and restoring them to the Lord, to yourself, and if need be, possibly to the church. Now, if relational restoration is going to happen when one believer sins against another, then the person who has been sinned against will need to forgive the person who sinned against them. Makes sense, right? So Peter... He's been listening, along with the other disciples, to Jesus talking about what we call church discipline. And he realizes that, that if this is going to happen in his life as an individual who's going to be sinned against by other followers of Jesus, if he's going to follow his Lord's instructions that he's just heard, then it's going to require him at times, at a very personal, individual level, to extend forgiveness to other disciples of Jesus that sin against him. And apparently this prompts Peter to then ask Jesus a question. And that's where our text picks up in verse 21. You can look there. We read that then, following these words from Christ, 
Peter came up, that is to the Lord, and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So, so Jesus tells his disciples, he clearly implies that they're going to need to forgive those who sin against them. And the first thing Peter says is, Jesus, how many times do I have to do that? I thought about that and I thought it's reminded me of a child who's told by one of his parents to, you know, go play in your bedroom. And immediately they ask, how long do I have to be in there for? <laughs> it's like, I'm willing to do it, but I want to know when is this going to end, you know? By the way, do you hear the assumption in Peter's question? Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? and I forgive him. You see what he's assuming? He's assuming that there is, what? A limit to the forgiveness that he and other disciples are going to be required to extend to those who sin against them. Now, I presume that this is most likely because at that time, we're told, there was some rabbinical teaching that went something like this. It taught that a Jew could choose, not even necessarily that they were required, but they could choose to forgive someone who had intentionally, premeditated, intentionally sinned against them once, twice, and even up to a third time. But if that same person sinned against them a fourth time, then that person should not forgive the offending party. Because they said it was obvious the person's not repentant since they've repeated the offense a fourth time. In fact, some even said to extend forgiveness at that point would be an unrighteous, unjust thing to do. So I presume that coming from that background with that mindset, Peter essentially is saying to Jesus, Master, I, I understand from what you're saying that I as an individual have a responsibility to forgive a fellow disciple who sins against me. And after all, that's what we've been taught even by our rabbis. And now we all know, as the rabbis have taught us, that there is a limit to the amount of times any of us are required to forgive a person who offends us. So what I want to know is, I know what the rabbis say, but I want to know, what do you say, Jesus, is the upper limit to the times we are required to forgive those who sin against us? And then interestingly, he asks a second question right on the heels of that. Look there again in verse 21. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as, or up to seven times? You might wonder, why seven? Seems perhaps like an arbitrary number, but we're not actually specifically told here. But as I thought about this, I recall Jesus' words earlier in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 5 and verse 20. You remember there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So there Jesus is saying, in the new covenant, under my law, as the lawgiver for my people in my kingdom, my disciples are going to be required to, to live by, and they will actually be marked by, through the gracious and effective regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, a practical life of righteousness. I think that's what he's stressing there. A practical life of righteousness that goes far beyond what was allowed or even required by, at the very least, the rabbinical teaching, spiritual leaders, and religious traditions of their time. So I think Peter remembers that, and he's, he's understanding that, that Jesus has been calling his disciples to a higher, deeper, more genuine, authentic righteousness than that of the Jews around him, even the most zealous leaders. And so he recognizes that if, if rabbis were allowing forgiveness up to three times, certainly then Jesus is going to require it to a higher level, right? It makes sense. But if Jesus is not simply going to allow his disciples to forgive each other, if he's actually commanding and requiring them to forgive each other, surely then there's got to be an upper limit somewhere, right? Because, I mean, nobody is able to actually forgive someone who sins against them an infinite amount of times, right? Perhaps Peter felt like 
doubling the rabbinical number from three to six and adding one more for good measure was really a fair and generous place to draw the line. But again, we're not explicitly told, so I'm not totally sure. And that's because that's not the most important thing. The most important thing to see here is, again, what Peter is essentially asking Jesus. Lord, when it comes to forgiving a person who sins against me, where can I draw the line? How far do I have to go? How many times are you requiring me and the others to forgive those who sin against us? I mean, when is enough enough? At what point am I no longer obligated to forgive that person? When am I allowed to withhold forgiveness from that person? It's really an important question, isn't it? I mean, if we confess, many of us here do this morning, to be followers of Jesus Christ, we want to live under his rule. We want to live according to his laws. We want our relationships with other believers, anyone, really, who sinned against us, not just believers, anyone who sinned against us. We want the way we relate to them to please the Lord, right? to honor him, to reflect his character and nature and the way he's dealt with and relates to us. And either we've been sinned against by someone in the distant or recent past, or we're going to be sinned against by someone in the near or distant future. It's going to happen in the local church. So it's a good question to ask, and it's one that I want to know the answer to. Jesus, what do you require of us when it comes to forgiving other believers who sin against us? Or to make it very personal, individual, and to take the words of Peter, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Let's listen to Jesus' response there in verse 22. Matthew tells us, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Now, by saying 77 times, Jesus is not simply telling Peter that his suggestion just needed a slight tweaking. Right? He's not saying to Peter, you know, Peter, that is an excellent question. Very astute. You've been listening very carefully to the way I've been teaching and what I've been requiring of you. And I really like how you've raised the bar, you know, from the Jewish rabbis from three to seven. Right? I take honor in that. But I just need to correct one thing in your thinking. You set the limit of forgiveness at seven, and that's a bit lower than what I, where I intend to set the limit. I intend you as my disciples to work not with a limit of seven, but with a limit of 77 times. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that his disciples are required to forgive another person 77 times, but the 78th time, we're not required to forgive the person. In fact, we're free to withhold forgiveness if we want to, harbor bitterness or resentment, seek some kind of repayment and extract personal vengeance on the offender. Jesus is not telling us to download the forgiveness app onto our smartphones. And then each time someone sins against us, open it up, get their name, check if they're already in the list. If they're not, put a new entry in and put number one, date and time, right? If they are, find their name and put tick number two or number three, date and time. Right? And if you're really generous and if you're really kind, then you'll put a reminder in your app to set a ding or a notification for maybe the 67th time, you know, like a, a 10, 10 time warning, right? And you can tell the person, just so you know, this is the 67th time I've forgiven you uh, in the last week. And uh, you've got 10 more left. You remember our Lord's words, don't you? 10 more. And then a five time warning. And then a you know, one-time warning, just so you know, this is the last time I'm going to forgive you. Could you imagine that? Someone sins against you for the 77th time. You've been keeping that record all along. However short or long that's taken, 
<clears throat> and then that last time you say to them, brother, sister, I forgive you with all my heart. FYI, this was number 77. Officially the last time I'm going to be forgiving you. After that, I won't. I just want to ask you please not to forget. By the way, see you Sunday at church. Right? <laughs> no. Remember what Jesus said through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13.5? Love does not keep a record of wrongs done. So then what is Jesus telling Peter when he says, not as many as seven times, but 77 times? I believe what Jesus is doing is that he's telling Peter the very way he's asked his questions demonstrates that he completely misunderstands the nature of, of the forgiveness that Jesus is calling us to show each other as his disciples. He's helping Peter to understand that his followers, for Christ's followers, there should be not just a higher limit than what the Jews practiced at that time, there should be no limit to the forgiveness that we extend each other in Christ. Jesus is not simply raising the bar of the upper limit on the amount of times we must forgive each other. He is completely removing the bar altogether. And that applies whether someone is regularly committing different small sins against you or repeating the same sin over and over against you. Even if someone has sinned against you in a very big, painful, personal way, Jesus calls us to extend forgiveness without limits to the person who sinned against us. We should be willing to forgive all people who sin against us, no matter what they've done, no matter how many times they've done it, no matter how much it has hurt us, no matter how long they've done it to us, no matter how much pain and suffering it has caused us. Now, Jesus knows, I love this about him, he knows that even for his children who are, are born again and have new hearts and have the Holy Spirit within them, he knows that living out consistently this kind of forgiveness, this is a radical kind of forgiveness that he calls us to, <clears throat> excuse me, so different from the way the Jews thought and operated at that time, so different than the way the world is, even the religious world in our time, he knows that he's calling us, in a, in a sense, to an impossible standard. So after saying this, he next gives a story, gives an illustration through a parable, beginning in verse 23. And I believe this story is meant to do two things. First, to illustrate why in the kingdom of God forgiveness is to be given between believers without limits. So to illustrate why it's to be this way. And second, to also help us actually live this out. To help us with certain truths to forgive each other as Christ wants us to. So he begins this parable in verse 23. He says there, Therefore, in light of what I've just said to you, I'm not calling you to forgive seven times or even just raising the limit, I'm calling you to forgive without limits those who sin against you in my kingdom. Therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Now, I believe here that the king in this story represents God. And the servants initially refer to all human beings indiscriminately. Every one of us who have been made by God. We've all been made by God. He's given us life, breath. He's given us this world to live in. He's given us our minds and our bodies. He's given us all that we are and all that we have. So as our maker, we are under his authority, whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not. And therefore, we are accountable to God for how we've lived. And so this pictures for us the reality that we as human beings are accountable before God, our maker, and our king creator, who's made us and given us life in his world. So Jesus continues 
It says, there's this king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, when he began to settle, one of his servants was brought to him who owed the king 10,000 talents. Now, a talent here is not referring to a, a natural ability. It's the highest unit of weight used by Israel at that time. And the word translated 10,000 is from the Greek word murias. It's often transliterated or translated in our English Bibles as myriads. Myriads and myriads. It's actually not a real number. It's supposed to communicate something that is innumerable, that is countless. It's like saying a gazillion talents. Is a gazillion a, a real number? Any, it's not, right? Okay, good. I'm not keeping up with all the new kind of words for all the extra zeros, and so I don't know if gazillion's being used. But you, I mean, kids talk that way. We talk that way, right? He's got a gazillion dollars. Or you're just making up a word, you know, to just try to describe. It's, it's a really big amount. It's a really large amount. You can't actually put a number to it. It's a whole bunch. And that's Jesus' point here. It's not necessarily to give us a quantifiable amount that the servant owed to the king. It would have been strange, don't you think, that it was exactly a perfect 10,000 talent debt. Probably wouldn't have been that exact. Jesus is just using a really big number to emphasize this point. The servant owed the king a massively large debt that was beyond his ability to ever pay off to the king. Even those who have tried to calculate how much this would have been, either in silver or in gold, even in silver, they've said it would have taken him an estimated 160,000 years to pay off his debt to the king. It's impossible, right? This man finds himself, Jesus tells us, totally helpless to do anything to pay off his debt to the king. He has no hope within himself, not in 160,000 years of paying off his debt to the king. It's impossible. And I think here Jesus is representing for us the natural state in which we find ourselves as sinners outside of the grace of God, outside of Jesus Christ. When we take the bodies and the minds that Jesus has given us, that God has given us, meant to live for Him, for His glory, for His praise, to know Him and enjoy Him and exalt Him in this life. When we take those faculties and all the resources and the relationships and the things He's entrusted to us, and we use them to commit an innumerable amount of sin against God our Maker. Whether it's through failing to love God as we should, by not giving him thanks, but grumbling and complaining, whether it's directly disobeying God, either through his written commandments of the word or just going against our consciences when he's speaking to us there, whether it's valuing and delighting in other things above him, trusting in or fearing other things or people more than him, whether it's failing to love others as ourselves by hating them, neglecting to care for them, selfishly using them, being jealous of them, lying to them, slandering or gossiping about them, speaking evil about them. Whatever the sin is, whether it's with our words, whether it's with our actions, even if it's just in the thoughts of our minds and the attitudes of our hearts, each of us have committed in our lives an innumerable, an incalculable amount of sin against God. And the reality is that when we sin against God, the Bible talks about it at times as though a, a real debt has been incurred before God. Our sin brings with it a debt that we then now owe to God. And that sin debt is larger than we can calculate. It's a mountain of sin that is far too great for any of us to ever pay back to God no matter how hard we try to obey him, no matter how good we try to be, no matter how much we, we strive to live, either according to our own consciences, according to the morals we've been taught, according to the standards of society, even according to God's own rules that he reveals to us in his word. Nothing we do is able to pay back the debt of sin we owe to God. Even in hell, 
it will never be paid off. You realize that? Because God is infinitely holy. It will take an infinite, infinite amount of time to pay off even one sin that we commit against God. Infinitely holy God, infinitely wicked sin that we commit. It's going to take eternity, which never ends. By the way, who says that in hell people stop sinning? I don't think they do. So we've got a massive debt before God that we have zero hope of ever paying off. We're in a helpless position, just like this servant before God. Nothing we can do, nothing we can say to cancel our sin debt or pay it off to God. This is where this servant finds himself before this king. Now what's the king going to do as he has this massive debtor standing in front of him with a debt that's completely unpayable? Look at verse 25. Jesus continues, he says, and because and since he, the servant, could not pay his debt, his master, that's the king, ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the king here has the authority, he has the right, the sovereign prerogative to do whatever he desires with this servant even with his family, his children, all that he has. They were indebted to him. They belonged to him. And because the servant would never be able to pay off his debt, even though, it's interesting here, it says, and payment to be made, that's not saying and the full payment to be made. Um, some writers have said that uh, the price of a, a slave at this time, I think, was maybe approximately 5,000 denarii. That's 5,000 days worth of wages that this king would have got by selling this man into slavery to someone else. 5,000 days of payment on a debt of 160,000 years. It's cents on the dollar, right? It's maybe fractions of cents on the dollar. He's not getting full payment here, but the king realizes, I gotta get something from this guy. He's never actually going to pay off his debt to me. And so he decides, I'm going to sell him, his family, all that he possesses, and at least get something back, some kind of return from this man. And in the same way, God has authority as our maker to do with us whatever he desires. And he would be completely righteous because of our sin against him and the debt that we owe him. He would be completely just to cast us out of his kingdom to send us away from his presence and to pour out upon us his just everlasting wrath in hell. Even though that is an incomplete satisfaction for all the sins that we've committed against him. Romans 6 and verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. That is physical death followed by an eternity of death separation from God himself in outer darkness. We deserve to die and to receive the conscious torment of God for how sinful we've been, how sinful we've lived. And that is what we will receive if our sin debt remains unpaid in this life. So, the servant hears that the king plans to sell him his whole family, all his possessions, how is he going to respond to that prospect? Look at verse 26. Jesus says, so, in light of that, this is what the servant did. The servant fell on his knees, imploring the king, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Under the weight of that miserable condition he's in and the expectation of what he and his family are about to experience, the servant just collapses before the king. And he takes the posture flat on his face before this man. This man who has authority to send him away, authority to do whatever he wants with him. And he simply looks up at this king and he begs his master for mercy. 
He says, please. It's interesting. He doesn't ask him, remove my debt. He just says, give me more time. Just give me more time, please. And I will pay you back everything I owe you. I just, I just need more time. You ever been in that position, in that condition? Where you know you've sinned grievously against someone and you owe them something for what you've done and all you can do is, there's nothing you can do to take it back, there's nothing you can do to make it right, all you can do is just plead with that person for mercy in that moment. Now it's interesting because this man, if he really thought about how great his debt was, surely he knew, I can't pay this back. There's no way I could pay this back. This is unpayable. 160,000 years take me to pay this back. He was facing an impossible situation. But, but you see, he's, he's just desperate. Right? When people are desperate and they realize their miserable, desperate condition, sometimes they'll just they'll say whatever they need to say or whatever comes to mind. They just, whatever comes out, because they're just desperately pleading for mercy and patience with the person they owe. He tells the king, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for however long it takes in order to satisfy my debt to you. Just give me more time. Don't sell me. Don't sell my family and our stuff. And I find this interesting. Like you, I've had many evangelistic conversations with unbelievers. And it's very common, I've found, that when a person gets even some sense of conviction of their sin against God, they realize to some degree that they've sinned against God, and that there is this real threat and danger of dying in their sins and being sent to hell, suffering the torment and wrath of God there in hell. Often, one of the first things that man or woman will do is ask, just tell me, what do I got to do? Just tell me. And the more desperate they are, the more they really sense their desperate, miserable condition, the more in that initial moment they don't know otherwise. They think, I got myself in this mess. Surely I can get myself out of it. Just tell me, what do I got to do? I got to read my Bible. I got to pray. I got to give money. I got to go to church. I got to make things right. Just tell me, what do I got to do? I'll do whatever it takes, however long it takes, to escape that threat of God's wrath that I see I rightly deserve and that I'm going to experience if I die in my sins. Even though they owe an unpayable debt to God, there's really nothing they can do to pay it off. Sinners often express a willingness to do whatever it takes for however long it takes to try to remove their sin debt, to try to earn forgiveness from God. This is what the servant was pleading, pleading before the king. Well, how's the king going to respond to this man who collapses on his knees before him and begs him for patience and promises to repay his debt. Verse 27, Jesus says, And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. If you're not shocked... When you hear what this king did, you're missing it. This is completely shocking. In fact, this is incredibly beautiful, isn't it? Proverbs 19, 11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. This is glorious. This is beautiful, what this king has just done to this servant. As he sees him bowed down, hears him pleading and begging for patience and more time, Jesus tells us that this king was filled with mercy inside. His heart was moved with compassion for the man, and out of that fullness overflowed pity. And the king decides in that moment he's not going to sell the man into slavery. More than that, he says, I'm going to actually forgive your entire debt. This is amazing. This is the best news this man has ever heard in his life. I wonder if he, he, he had to say, wait, wait, what? What did you say? Yeah, I'm not just giving you more time. 
I'm completely forgiving your debt paid in full. You owe me nothing anymore. I release you from the requirement to repay me what you owe me. If he had chains on, he probably said to the, to the guards, cut him loose, release him, release his family. He's a free man. He doesn't owe me anything ever again. And here, I believe we see a beautiful picture of the way that God forgives our sins. Not because of anything in us that is worthy of his pity. Not because of anything we're able to do or that we actually do that earns his compassion. But simply because God, by his own nature, loves to save sinners. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He takes pleasure in saving the wicked from their sins and from the consequences of their sins. He is naturally slow to anger, abounding in grace. And because he delights to show mercy to helpless sinners, he freely chooses to wipe out our debt and to forgive us. Um, I trust many of you are familiar with The Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan. One of my favorite characters in that book is a man by the name of Mr. Goodwill. Um, Christian or pilgrim, goes by different names and sometimes uh, he's under this burden of his sin early on as he's reading this book, the Bible, and he's learning that in the future the judgment of God is coming and he's sinned against God and as he keeps reading this burden and weight of his sin grows heavier and heavier and it's going to sink him down into hell if he doesn't find release, relief somewhere, someone that can take off his burden. He's told by a man named Evangelist that he needs to, to go to the wicked gate and there he'll meet a man who can show him the way by which he can have this sin burden removed from him. And he gets to the wicked gate early on in, in the book. And there at the gate, he meets a man there at the door named Mr. Goodwill. Mr. Goodwill asks him, who are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going? And he, he tells him his name and how he's been under this burden of sin. He says, I'm a poor, helpless sinner under the burden of my sin. And I've been told that someone here at this gate could show me the way by which my sins can be removed and my burden can be released. I could be set free. And he says, and so I, I would enter in this door and travel on the narrow way to find that forgiveness if you are willing to let me in. And I love these words Bunyan puts. He says in the mouth of Mr. Goodwill, I am willing with all my heart. You see that? It's representing the heart of God for sinners. I heard a man once say, God is more willing to forgive sinners than sinners desire to be forgiven by him. Okay? We see that in the life of Jesus Christ, don't we? He came to seek and to save the lost. He loved to eat and drink with sinners. Not to coddle them and encourage them in their sin, but to show them the free, lavished mercy and love of God for those who would turn and follow him. Now the irony <clears throat> I see in this is that the very man who's telling this parable in order to illustrate God's free and full, merciful forgiveness of sinners is Jesus. And he's the very person who in the near future is going to go to the cross, isn't he? And there he's going to pay the debt for our sins, for all those who would trust in him. He's going to go there and take the wages of our sin. He's going to experience death himself on the cross and make payment to God in our place. He's going to live the life we failed to live. He's going to die the death we deserve to die. And he's going to release the floodgates of God's free, full mercy and forgiveness for all those who trust in him. He pays the full certificate of debt that we owed to God as he gives up his life as a ransom to cancel it out. That's what Colossians 2 says in verses 13 and 14. God has forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So in the parable here, the servant's experience of the merciful forgiveness of his master 
it parallels the believer's experience of the merciful forgiveness of God through trusting in Jesus Christ to pay his sin debt. Now, how's this, <clears throat> excuse me, how's this servant uh, going to go out and live now that he's a forgiven and a free man? Look at verse 28. Jesus says, but, and that ought to give us pause for concern. But when that same servant, oh boy, went out, it's from the presence of the king who's just forgiven him, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. Immediately after leaving the presence of the king as a forgiven man, forgiven of an unpayable, repayable debt, he comes across a fellow servant of his under the king who owes him a hundred denarii. It's a hundred days wages. It's a large amount, but it's by no means an unrepayable amount. It could be paid with time. And again, here I think what Jesus is doing is he's setting up the scenario that those of us who have trusted in him and have received through his death and resurrection full, free mercy and forgiveness of God, he's painting the scenario now that after that, there's going to come a time when a, a fellow servant now of King Jesus, a, another disciple of his, a brother or sister in Christ, in the body of Christ, perhaps in the local church, is going to sin against us. You see, this implies that there's a, a kind of debt that the one who sins owes to the person who's been sinned against. I'll say more about that later. And you would expect, wouldn't you, that this servant, just floating on the forgiveness he's just experienced, would be quick to forgive his fellow servant. But instead, what does he do? He, he grabs him and begins choking him, Jesus says. He's, he's throttling him at the neck and saying to him, pay back what you owe. It's completely contrary to the way he should have acted. Completely contrary to the way we would have expected him to act to his fellow servant. He should have been humbled, right? By the mercy he had just received from the king. He should have been filled with so much wonder and joy that he had been forgiven fully, forever forgiven by that king. It should have transformed the way he thought about the debts that others had toward him and the way he related to those who were indebted to him. But apparently, he didn't. Having so quickly forgotten what he had just experienced, he begins choking the man and demanding he pay back what he owes. Now this is interesting. Notice what his fellow servant does in verse 29. Jesus says, so, this guy's got his hands around his neck, his fellow servant falls down and pleaded with him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you. It's interesting, isn't it? It's almost exactly what the first servant did in the presence of the king he owed a debt to, isn't it? He falls down on his knees, asks for patience, promises to repay the debt that he owes. So you would have expected that if the, if the servant who had been forgiven just for some reason initially got it wrong, certainly when he sees his fellow servant fall on his knees the same way he did, plead with him the same way he did, even use the exact words that he had just used with the king, he would have right, pulled his hands back and said, oh, wait a what have I done? I mean, I was in your position and way worse, and the king just forgave me a massive amount of debt. How can I put these hands that have just been set free by the king and bind your neck with them. How can I do that? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, brother. Forgive me. I forgot what just happened to me. I can't believe I've just done that. But he doesn't. It gets worse. 
Jesus says in verse 30, when the man pleads with him and asks him to have patience and promises to pay him back, not only did he tell him, I'm not forgiving your debt, not only did he not tell him, I'll give you more time, verse 30, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So the forgiven servant takes his fellow servant and actually has him thrown into debtor's prison and says, you will sit in there until you pay off every last penny you owe me. And sadly, this represents believers who have received the forgiveness of their sins according to the free mercy of God. And yet, when they are sinned against by someone, they do the unthinkable. It's unthinkable, isn't it? They're unwilling to extend that same forgiveness to the one who has sinned against them. Well, the story's not over. Something that's going to happen to the unforgiving servant here. Look at verses 31 to 33. Jesus says, when his fellow servants, there were some other servants around and saw this, when they saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, rightfully so. I mean, this is shocking. This, maybe this is more shocking than the king forgiving his debt. When they saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Word gets back to the king how his servant has treated a fellow servant. So he says, get him back here in my presence immediately. Calls him in to speak to him again. And again, notice how he describes his servant. He says, you wicked servant. You have acted in a wicked, evil, vicious way toward your fellow servant. He tells him, the way you've treated your servant is so completely contrary to the way I just treated you. <clears throat> That's what makes it so wicked. It's a great dishonor to the king, isn't it? It is a great dishonor to God when professing believers refuse to extend forgiveness to those who sin against them. It blasphemes the name of God. We just had it read. Hallowed, sanctified, honored be your name. But we blaspheme and dishonor the name of God when we refuse to reflect to those who sin against us the mercy and forgiveness that we say, we claim we've received from God in Jesus Christ. It's a complete misrepresentation of the way he is and the way he's treated us. The king reminds the servant of this unpayable mountain of debt that he owed him, how he mercifully forgave him simply because he pleaded with him. And he says, in the same way you should have forgiven your fellow servant. Similarly, we who are believers in Christ are instructed by Jesus to show the same merciful forgiveness to one another that he has shown us. Listen to Ephesians 4, verse 32. It says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. See that? So through the Apostle Paul, Christ commands that we forgive one another, just as God has forgiven us, in Christ. Having received, having been the recipients of God's abundant free forgiveness, we have a moral responsibility. We should, we, we ought to. It is fitting and appropriate and right that we joyfully lavish on one another limitless free forgiveness that we've received from God in Christ. What's the king going to do with this unmerciful, unforgiving servant? Verse 34. Jesus says, And in anger his master delivered him over to the jailers until he should pay all his 
debt. You see the contrast in the disposition of the king now, his, his demeanor. Previously, he was filled with pity <clears throat> and mercy. He forgave the servant his debt. But this time, Jesus says he's filled with anger. And he consigns the man to a lifelong sentence in debtor's prison. This man will never pay it off. He's going to die in debtor's prison. And then notice the connection, very explicit here, that Jesus makes with us. He says in verse 35, So also, in the same way too, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. So Jesus says, in the same way the king ultimately held the servant's debt against him and made him pay for it in prison, in the end of time, God will count our sins against us. He will hold us guilty of our sins and consign us to the prison of hell forever if we refuse to forgive those who sin against us. On the day of judgment, God will treat us the way we've treated others. You know that's actually what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer? You actually, I'm sure you have, but I just recommend again, think about those words that were read earlier in Matthew 6, saying to our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. We're asking God to treat us and our sins against him just as we treat others and their sins against us. That is a bold prayer to pray. Very dangerous prayer to pray, especially if you're withholding forgiveness from someone who sinned against you. You probably should not pray that because you're asking God, don't forgive my sins, withhold forgiveness from me the way I'm withholding it from someone else. In the day of judgment over the gate of heaven will be the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And written over the gate of hell are the words of James 2.13, to the merciless, judgment will be merciless. If you will not reflect God's mercy and forgiveness toward others, God will reflect your mercilessness toward you. Now, I said earlier I believe this parable is intended to do two things. First, to illustrate the limitless forgiveness that we're to grant those who sin against us as those who claim to be forgiven by God in Christ. Just as the king forgave his servant an infinite amount of debt, so we also should reflect that forgiveness without limits to those who offend us and incur debt against us. Now, if we're going to do that, I think it's just helpful to take a moment, and this probably isn't new for many of you, but just to think about what does it actually mean to forgive? In this passage, the word forgive appears four times. In this context, it means to release someone's debt. Pretty clear in the parable that Jesus gives here, the way the king releases the debt of his servant and the way the, second ser the forgiven servant was expected to release the debt of his fellow servant. I mentioned this means that when someone sins against us, they incur a kind of debt. They become indebted to us, and that puts us as the offended party in a position where we have a choice. We can either, one, choose to hold that debt against them and require them to pay it back or make it right or to do something or experience something for what they've done to us. Or two, we can choose to forgive their debt, to cancel it out, to no longer hold it against them, to give up the right to extract payment to no longer require them to do anything or experience anything in order to pay us back and satisfy the wrong that they've done to us. And you notice here in verse 35, look there again, Jesus says to, to truly forgive someone, it needs to come not just in our words, but from where? From our hearts, right? It's not enough to just say, I forgive you, or, oh, I've forgiven that person, tell others that you've forgiven them. It actually has to come sincerely from your heart, from the inner attitudes and thoughts of our minds. Then it will manifest itself in the way we relate to and speak to and speak about the person we say we've forgiven. How can we know if we may not have truly forgiven someone from our hearts? 
think it's a good question to ask since Jesus says we must forgive from the heart. This isn't an exhaustive list, but as I thought about it, here's maybe a few, a few ways by which, a few indicators, a few realities that may indicate, I should say, that we're not forgiving someone. Perhaps if we keep bringing what they did Perhaps if we keep bringing what they did to us back up in conversation with them and reminding the person about it, maybe how terrible it was, how hurt we were by it, maybe if we keep a mental record of how many times or how often they've done something, even sometimes remind the person how many times it has been, if we feel compelled to regularly tell others about it, not in a respectful way that protects the other person's reputation, but out of a desire to be disrespectful to them, that exposes and shames them, just wants others to know how bad they've been to us, how much they've hurt us, how much we've had to put up with from them. If we find ourselves stewing and dwelling on what they've done to us, thinking about ways that we can punish the person. If we notice that we're easily angry, have outbursts of wrath, deal harshly and aggressively with the person. If we harbor feelings of bitterness and resentment, if we hold a grudge against that person, if we secretly desire that they suffer or some evil befall them in order to pay back what they did to us, that they be shamed or humiliated for what they've done, if we vindictively long for them to get what we think they deserve for satisfying our offense, if we find that we cannot honestly pray for the person and wish well upon them and rejoice when things go well for them, these may all be signs that we've not truly forgiven someone who sinned against us from the heart. And again, just briefly, I, I think it's helpful just to mention in light of that, forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean that you completely forget what the person has done to you. When God says he will not remember our sins, it doesn't mean that they've been removed from his knowledge of the past. It means he will not bring them to mind in order to hold them against us in exact payment for them because they've already been paid for at the cross through Jesus Christ. In the same way, when we forgive, it doesn't mean that it's totally erased from our memory bank or that it won't come to mind from time to time. But what it does mean is that when it comes to mind, we will remind ourselves that we've chosen before God to freely forgive that person and to release them from the debt they incurred against us and to hold it against them ever again. Forgiveness does not mean that we act as though the offense never happened or that there may not be consequences for the person who has done wrong. If a worker steals from you, you should forgive them. But it may mean that they should lose their job or that you can no longer trust them to perform certain tasks or to be given unmonitored access to certain things or areas. I think if we're honest, most of us, at some time or another, have found that forgiving others who sin against us, forgiving them the way God has forgiven us, the way we've heard about here from the lips of Jesus, without limits, sincerely from the heart, is something that we know we should do and we want to do, but something that at times we can find very difficult to do. And I think that's partly because of the culture we live in. Our culture encourages us to bear grudges, doesn't it? It promotes getting even. And you see a, a whole slew of movies that are built on the premise of personal vengeance. Someone's wrong in the beginning of the film, and the whole film is just the, the chronicling of how they get even with the one who hurt them at the beginning. Our society is full of resentment and bitterness and the desire to stick it to the person who's wronged us. But we also struggle with it partly because of the pride that remains in us as we live in these unredeemed bodies and our inability at times to trust God with what someone has done to us. Perhaps the two strongest roots of unforgiveness are pride and unbelief. You know, the pride that says, I will not let this person go. Do you understand what they did to me? How badly they hurt me? Even if they did it to someone I love, it's someone I love. It's someone who's precious to me. See, self is in the forefront 
pride is. And unbelief. I just can't trust God. This is essentially what we're saying when we don't forgive, right? I just can't trust God with what someone has done to me. And I can't trust God that, as we heard earlier, that he's on the throne and that he will right every wrong in the end. No, it's got to be made right now and on my terms, how I want it and how I say it should be done. John Piper has helpfully said, if you hold a grudge, you doubt the judge. He's right. And our struggle to forgive is also due largely to the fact, I think I need to acknowledge this, that we live in a fallen world where people really hurt us and harm us. There's some serious evil and suffering that takes place, and as we saw last Sunday morning, even in the lives of the children of God. Sometimes a person commits the same repeated sin against us in quick succession or over a long period of time, and we begin to wonder, are they truly repentant? How long is this going to go on for? It makes it increasingly difficult to continually forgive them. Sometimes a person commits a certain kind of sin against us, and either because of the actual nature of it and the severity of that act, how it's affected us, how it's hurt us, the real raw pain and wound it's left, the scars it's produced on our bodies, on our minds, on our emotions, or because of how we perceive it, we struggle to truly forgive that person. I could adapt the words of another pastor for us here this morning and say, in this room, there are likely people who have been harmed by slander. Maybe you've had a friend or a co-worker that told a lie that was not true. It spread and you were harmed as your character was damaged by someone's lie that tore you down. For some people in this room, you lost a job. It was nothing you did or did not do. A new boss came in and wanted to change the direction of the company and his decision impacted you both financially as well as personally. Others of you may have been emotionally manipulated, physically abused, sexually taken advantage of by someone. They've scarred you and the hurt and pain has stayed with you. Perhaps no one or very few people even know what has happened, but the pain still exists. You've learned not to trust anyone. For some of us, we have had a spouse that cheated on us or took advantage of us or failed us by misusing money and living a reckless life. That pain is still there. And today you are still living with the consequences of their selfish and poor decisions. In a room of this many people, there are many hurts and painful experiences we've all gone through. If we are honest and everyone shared their story, we would be amazed at how much pain, anger, and heartache we've gone through. Almost everyone has an offense and a painful experience they've had to deal with. Now, that's not even an exhaustive list. But as you, you heard those words, either you could completely relate because you've experienced one of those exact things, or there's someone else and some other painful experience that's come to mind. Perhaps in the past, perhaps presently. Someone who sinned against you, who seriously sinned against you. And if you're honest, you'd say, I've not yet forgiven that person. In fact, I'm really struggling to forgive that person. I may have said I forgive them with my lips, but honestly from the heart, God knows, I'm still bitter and resentful toward that person. I've not really forgiven them. Listen, and I say this, I try to say it with all the sensitivity I can, not knowing what you've been through or what you're going through. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what anyone has done to you, Jesus wants you to forgive that person. He wants you to offer immediate, full, free forgiveness to that person. In the same way, God has given it to you. Let me just mention, as I close here, three helps that I think we see from this parable that Jesus gives in order to not just tell you Jesus wants you to forgive that person, but to highlight, we've already seen these, but to highlight three realities from the parable Jesus has given to help you and to help me actually forgive those who have sinned against us or who will sin against us in the future. Three reminders. When we're struggling to forgive someone, call these to mind. 
And I think the Lord will use them to help us forgive the one who sinned against us. Three reminders. First, remember the threat. Remember the threat. Look again at verse 35. Jesus says, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Remember the threat. Sometimes Jesus motivates his disciples to action by threatening terrible things if we will not obey him. He does that. And here he says, if we will not forgive those who sin against us, God will not forgive us. If we harbor bitterness and resentment, if we indulge in vengeful thoughts, if we withhold forgiveness and refuse to release another person who's offended us, then on the day of judgment, God will not forgive us. So when you're tempted to be unforgiving toward another person, remember these words from Jesus. If you want God to forgive your sins, unconditionally extend the unlimited forgiveness that he offers in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you must do the same to those who have sinned against you. By the way, this is not Jesus teaching some form of salvation by works. This is not justification by forgiveness. It's not by the act of forgiving others that we somehow earn the forgiveness of God. You notice the order in the parable, right? What happened first? The servant was forgiven by the king. Then he was to go out and reflect that forgiveness to his fellow servant. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying an unforgiving person is an unforgiven person. A person who withholds forgiveness, even from one person who sinned against them, shows that they have not received the forgiveness and mercy of God. Their heart has not experienced that. Otherwise, they would be enabled. Even if it's difficult, even for a season of time if they've struggled, they will inevitably be enabled by the Spirit of Christ within them to forgive that person because they've received that forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The day of judgment will show that unforgiving people were unforgiven. They had not tasted and received the forgiveness of Christ, and therefore they withheld it from those around them. Remember the threat. Second, remember the debt. Remember the debt. This servant in the parable owed a mountain of sin debt to the king. And again, outside of Jesus Christ, you and I owed. We who are believers this morning, we used to have this debt. Those of you who are here that are not yet believers in Jesus Christ, you presently owe a massive debt, a sin debt, a Mount Everest of debt of sin to God that you cannot climb, that you cannot pay for the sins you've committed against him. And if you realize that, then by comparison, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very sensitive knowing that some of you have probably experienced, have experienced very painful, big offenses and hurts in your life. But by comparison to the way you've sinned against God, to the mountain of your sin against God, someone else's sin against you, even in the most grievous way, is very small compared to the way you've sinned against God. And if God, through Jesus Christ, can send a tsunami, a tidal wave of where your sin increased, his grace increased all the more like the flood covering the tops of the mountains of your sin. If he could forgive you for your sin, how dare you? If he has forgiven you for your sin, how dare you withhold forgiveness from someone who sinned against you? If he did not withhold his own son, Jesus Christ, but gave him up, was willing to give up his own dear son, his most prized possession, to send him into this world and to crush him on the cross for your sins, is there anything that should stand in the way of you forgiving a brother or sister in Christ? The answer is no. And that's the third thing. So remember the threat, remember the debt, remember the forgiveness. When someone sins against you, remember the way God has treated you mercifully in Jesus Christ. God has been so patient with us, hasn't he? He really has. He's been so kind to us. And especially when we sin against him as believers, it's just amazing to think 
that all those sins, past, present, and future, were fully paid for through the death of Jesus Christ. That he's fully, freely, forever forgiven us. He will not bring it up again and hold them against us on the day of judgment. When we remember that, and we bask in that, and we receive that and enjoy that, then it will enable us to show that same kind of mercy and forgiveness to those who've sinned against us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for these words from your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we're challenged by them, and we're also very much encouraged by them. For we who belong to you have received full and forever forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. And we pray you'd help us to remind ourselves of that every day, every moment, especially when someone sins against us. Oh, God, help us in that moment when they sin, either before you or before them, if they come and acknowledge it, to express that it is our joy, having been forgiven by God so much sin, to forgive them their sin against us. Help us, please. We want Christ to be honored. We want you to be glorified. Help us to reflect in our lives that mercy and forgiveness you've shown to us. And Father, we ask, please, that you would draw irresistibly to Jesus Christ this morning, those who are still in their sin and under a debt to you. God, help them to turn from their sin and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be fully forgiven. We ask this for his sake. Amen.